At Malden and Jenkins, we believe that by working together, we can accomplish anything. Providing high quality assurance, tax advisory services allows you, our client, to measure your results by integrating cutting edge insights and techniques. By providing expertise, we can help you thrive in an ever evolving environment. With over 300 talented professionals, we invite you to explore what M&J can do to help you achieve your goals for the present and future as your long-term partner. Together, we can do anything. Okay. Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being with us. I'm Jeff Hisito. I'm, I'm partner in charge of our advisory practice, and I'm in partner in charge of our Atlanta office with um, Malden and Jenkins and um, work a lot um, in our nonprofit practice with those services. And then I have Elisa Howell with me, who's in charge of our nonprofit practice. And um, we're gonna hopefully give you some insights today that are some things that we're experiencing post COVID. I hope I can use that word um, post COVID. I'm feeling like I can, but I'm not absolutely sure. But I think we're, um, we're enough post COVID where we can use that term and hopefully it will stay that way. And um, welcome to the Six Effective Nonprofit Leadership Summit. And thank you for participating. And um, I'm, I always feel like um, we need to thank you for everything that you do in the nonprofit community um, with all of your organizations across Georgia and the Southeast, because it makes a big difference in our community. And um, really our um, world could not exist without nonprofit organizations. And when I, when I talk to people who aren't really in the nonprofit community, um, I'm always pointing out all the different things that nonprofits do, and they don't even realize the impact that nonprofits have sometimes. So once again, thanks for everything that you do. And we hope that today inspires ideas and discussions around the ways that you can make your organization more effective. And we're gonna do our best to kind of point out some things that maybe we'll do that. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, type them into the control panel and then we'll address those during and after the presentation. So if you can, do your best to ask us a few questions. I can't guarantee that we can answer them, but we will try. And um, we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. And now I'd like to introduce Lighthouse Council President Jeff Jowdy, um, who'll share a few comments. Great. Thank you, Jeff, and, and good morning to everybody. We are thrilled to be in our partnership with Malden Jenkins. As Jeff mentioned, our our sixth event. Uh, we're grateful to everyone for their participation. We've got a great program in store for you. And so uh, to kick us off, uh, Jeff and Elisa will talk about post-pandemic learnings in financial management. So we've got a great start to our sixth uh, summit. Jeff and Elisa. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so we are going to try to not get real technical in some of these discussions, but we might veer off a little bit and get a little bit technical, but I, I'm basically gonna try to make a few points throughout our presentation that's something um, that's practical that you can take with you and, and apply. And, um, and then don't, one thing that I like to tell people when we're making presentations, don't worry too much about the details if we say something that you don't quite understand, just kind of, pay attention to the main point and know that you need to maybe look into something possibly um, without entirely understanding all the details right now. And I, I think that's helpful, you know, when you're participating in any um, sort of webinar. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is PPP, which um, I um, luckily have been able to stop dreaming about PPP. At one point in time, I was doing that on a regular basis, which was not healthy, but, um, but anyway, so what, what's kind of a funny thing for me now, um, we are actually talking about PPP forgiveness. And as you all, um, I'm sure are aware, there's no longer any PPP, fun, PPP funds available. And what's a little bit scary now is thinking about how long it's been since the first round of PPP came out. And then the second round of PPP came out. And now we're entering into this uh, forgiveness period of time where you need to apply for forgiveness. And just to remind everybody, um, this is a loan that you received. It's interest-bearing loan at 1% interest. It has loan terms. If you actually look at your loan document, it's a legal loan document. 
And until it is forgiven, um, you have an obligation to pay that money back. So it's, it's really important that you pay attention to the deadlines associated with PPP forgiveness, that you prepare your application correctly, that you understand how to work with your bank in submitting your application. I was talking to somebody yesterday who is not able to um, get her logins to submit her PPP forgiveness application with her bank. And you just wanna make sure you've got all your ducks in a, in a row to um, make this successful. And um, I'm going to point out just a few key things in regard to this. So your loans will be fully forgiven as long as you meet certain criteria. And we'll go into those in a little bit of detail. And if you don't meet those criteria, then you, know, you have a loan and that loan will either be a two-year loan, depending on when you got it, or it's a five-year loan. So right around the middle of June, um, the bank started issuing five-year loans. And then prior to that, I'm talking about June of, of um, 2020, prior to that, um, it was a two-year loan. So um, you, you would want to look at your loan document if you're curious about what your loan terms are, if you're worried about that. And um, one thing to pay attention to is, if you all recall, you had a covered period where you had to incur certain costs that were eligible for this forgiveness. And that covered period was eight to 24 weeks. So at the moment, um, people are utilizing the 24 week period of time for their second PPP loan in order to maximize the employee retention credit, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. And then another thing that um, was a big deal, and just to remind everybody, if you received an EIDL advance of $10,000, it does not reduce your forgiveness. At one point in time, it was thought that it was gonna reduce your forgiveness, but it, it does not. So um, just a few basic points here. When you're applying for forgiveness, at least 60% has to be payroll. And then the other 40% can be these non-payroll expenses that you see on your screen. And um, the primary expense there is rent obligations, utility payments, and then you can see there's some other items, mortgage obligations. What most people are doing just to keep things simple, unless you can take advantage of the employee retention credit, is they're just um, putting 100% of payroll in their PPP um, forgiveness application and then not even identifying any other expenses. And you can do that. It has to be a minimum of 60% of payroll, but it can be 100% payroll, payroll if you want it to be. We, we actually, we get that question a lot. And, and, and like I mentioned in a second, this can be a little trickier because if you're taking advantage of the employee retention credit, um, you cannot double up. So if you're gonna use payroll expenses for the employee retention credit, you can't use those same expenses for this PPP forgiveness application. And what you might end up doing is utilizing some of these items that qualify in this 40% category um, so that you have more payroll expense to use for your employee retention credit, once again, if you qualify for that. Um, we're not gonna go into details about this, but just to remind everybody, there's a couple of ways that your forgiveness application might reduce the amount that you're gonna be forgiven by. And the main ways that that could occur is if you had a reduction in FTEs, full-time equivalents, or if you had a reduction in wages. And a reduction in wages is where you actually cut the hourly rate or you um, cut the annual salary. So it's an actual reduction. And, um, and then in regard to 50 FTEs, there's different periods that you can compare your covered period to in order to see if you had a reduction in FTEs. Now, if you had a reduction, actually, I can't say that I've had a client yet, and we've done a lot of these forgiveness applications where they've had a wage reduction, um, but we have had clients that had an FTE reduction when you go through the math. And um, just to give you some comfort, even if you've had an FTE reduction, Oftentimes, if you're using more expense than what you borrowed on your application, it will offset the FTE reduction and you'll have full forgiveness. So um, don't get too worried if you have an FTE reduction because more often than not, there's a way to still not have a reduction in your forgiveness by just having more covered expenses in the period of time that you've selected in your, your forgiveness application. Another thing um, that I wanted to point out because this creates a phone call for us on a fairly regular basis. 
um, you more likely than not will receive a request for a form 3509 or for a form 3510 for nonprofits. And it's a loan necessity questionnaire, pretty detailed document that SBA is using to evaluate your forgiveness application. And there's, don't be too alarmed by the questions that are asked on this form because there's some question about how this form is going to be utilized, if at all. And um, I've heard different opinions about that. And you might answer a question on this form and think, oh, great, you know, that doesn't sound good. I'm not going to receive forgiveness. And that is not the case. I've had multiple clients um, where they responded with this form and answered a question that did not sound favorable, but still receive full forgiveness. So don't, don't be too alarmed by it. And it's something that a lot of people are having to complete. So that's why we're mentioning it here. Um, another thing that um, we, we have to mention because we're auditors is maintaining documentation is primarily payroll documentation. So make sure you keep that, that documentation in your records. And then um, the SBA, is theoretically um, going through this, we'll be going through like an audit process of some of the um, information that's being submitted. And there, there's so many of these that um, they're using the IRS to some extent. And um, we're just, so the big, the big thing here is that there is an audit process. Hopefully you won't be subject to that audit process, but if you are, as long as you maintain your documentation, then you know there's no problem. All right, so th this is kind of a, this screen might be the most important screen in this discussion about PPP forgiveness. And um, there's a lot of confusion about when you need to apply for forgiveness. So keep in mind that after, or first of all, if you look at your loan document, oftentimes it's not gonna be correct because after your loan was issued, SBA made changes to this program. And I was, I was actually looking at a loan document with a client yesterday and it said that they should have been making payments on their loan um, starting about six months ago. And um, in reality, they should not be making payments on their loan yet. And the reason for that is because SBA has come back and said that after the end of your covered period, so if you all recall, your covered period can be anywhere from eight to 24 weeks subsequent to when you received your money, your, your loan money. So at the end of that covered period, um, that you then have 10 months um, after that. And then at the end of that 10 months is when you might be required to start making your principal and interest payments if you have not applied for forgiveness. So the big thing is you just want to, uh, for your PPP round one or round two, you want to apply for forgiveness um, prior to the start of that period um, just to avoid having to make payments. Now, let's say that um, you've missed that timeline and you're, you're running late on getting your application done. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be forgiven. You actually have until the end of your loan period um, to be forgiven and apply for forgiveness. And I'm assuming that they would refund you any payments that you made. But of course, it's undesirable to make payments you know, for something that you're hopefully going to be forgiven for. So once again, end of your covered period from the date that you received your money, which is eight to 24 weeks after you received your money, you have 10 months after that, and that's when your initial loan payment, your monthly payments will become due unless you've applied for forgiveness and um, started that process. And banks are, even though your loan document says one thing, banks aren't um, holding you generally to that loan document and they're, they're paying attention to those SBA rules. Um, just to point out here, um, a lot of the time, if you did not have an FTE reduction or a reduction in covered wages, there's an easy form that you can complete that literally will take you half an hour to apply for forgiveness. So it's a real easy process. Your payroll provider, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, almost all the payroll companies I'm aware of have come up with um, programming to where they are generating reports where you can just take that information and put it in your forgiveness application to document your covered payroll costs. So don't, don't go through your existing payroll reports and crunch all those numbers and try to figure out your FTEs and your, your salaries that are part of this loan forgiveness. Um, request that information from your payroll company and they'll usually give you this beautiful report 
that does all the math and you're literally just taking those numbers and putting them on your forgiveness application. And, um, and then if you've received um, up to $150,000, there's a new one page forgiveness form. Well, it's actually not new any longer, but there's a one page forgiveness form that's even simpler than the easy form. So um, big point here is it's not difficult to go through this process because most of the time there's not a reduction in FTEs and there's not a reduction in covered wages. And even if there is, the full form is not overwhelming because you can take the information straight off your payroll reports. Employee retention credit. So this is one of those things where we're not doing a class today on the employee retention credit, but if you have not evaluated whether this qualifies for you, you need to do that because there's a lot of money available here through this employee retention credit program. And you need to make sure that you qualify or you do not qualify. And we've had a surprising number of clients who thought they didn't qualify who did qualify. And um, we're not like selling Malden and Jenkins services here, but I, I actually identified one of our tax people to be an expert in this area and he's been working directly with our clients to see if they do qualify and um, we've had really great results um, from being able to help people participate in this program so i'm gonna i don't want to get into too much detail so i'm gonna skip a few of these screens but in general um, this screen talks about how much you can receive per full-time employee if you qualify and um, for 2020, you can receive up to $5,000 per full-time employee. And for 2021, you can receive up to $7,000 um, per full-time employee. And the way that you receive the money is you um, receive a reduction off your payroll taxes on your 941. And um, they will actually, if you have to go back to 2020 or even the first quarter of 2021 and amend your payroll returns for this credit, um, they'll send you a check. and. I, um, I got a text from a client the other day that had a, it was like a $280,000 check that they were wondering what it was. And it was where um, we had amended a prior form 941 for that client to take advantage of this employee retention credit. And the IRS sent them a check. And it was actually surprising to me how quickly they received the money because the IRS is bogged down in a lot of different ways right now, but they were, they're really good about processing these um, 941s in regard to this employee retention credit because they're trying to get the money out there to help people you know through this post pandemic period so once again um we don't want to get into a lot of details but this is an important screen because it talks about how you do qualify and there's a couple of different ways you can qualify if you were if your business was fully or partially suspended um, due to orders from federal or state government um, you know, in regard to commerce, travel, group meetings due to COVID, then you qualify. And there's a more expanded definition of this, and this is where it gets a little fuzzy. And if you think that you might meet this criteria, um, you probably need a professional to help you evaluate if you meet that criteria. But a lot of people meet criteria here where they thought they didn't qualify. So that's one big item to pay attention to. The um, other item where you can qualify is this gross receipts test, where if you had more than at least a 50% decline for 2020 of um, quarter over quarter in revenue, and then for 2021, they made it easier to qualify, and it was a 20% decline in revenue um, quarter over quarter in the, let's say as an example, in the first quarter of 2021 compared to the first quarter of 2019, um, then you qualify for this credit. And once again, if you remember the previous screen, it can be significant and literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even if you don't meet these um, gross receipts qualifications, pay attention to the fully or partially suspended due to order qualification. And this screen gives you a little bit more information about that and what it means. And there's all sorts of ways that you can qualify under this particular criteria and um, just once again, it's just something to pay attention to and don't expect to know all the details of it from this presentation and then ask your professional um, if you qualify maybe under this criteria or the um, gross receipts test. 
And then um, once again, um, this screen is, is giving more information about the definition of an order from a government authority. So we had a, a client that um, participates in trade shows and that's really their business. And they qualified under this criteria because basically um, large spaces were shut down in Vegas and all around the country um, from um, government orders, you know, that were passed through the states. And just that one thing allowed them to qualify for this credit. Um, I, I mentioned it already, but here we're talking about how do I actually get my money back and you're, you're getting it back on your 941s, which is your quarterly payroll return. So it's a reduction of your payroll tax. Once again, if you have to go back and amend, you know, because, um, you know, you hadn't done this for the last quarter or for the um, quarter in 2020 where you could apply for this, then you'll actually get a check. And then if you do it um, now, like for the June quarter, um, then it will just be a reduction of how much you have to pay in regard to your payroll taxes. So hopefully that's that's helpful for those um, that are in the forgiveness process or evaluating if you qualify for this employee retention credit. So it's more of a financial thing to consider in this post pandemic environment. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Elisa. We're gonna talk about something a little bit different. We're gonna talk about liquidity. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, like as Jeff mentioned, it's really important um, as everybody has seen liquidity in this environment. Um, just really paying attention. It's always been a um, really a hot topic for nonprofits of how much available cash and other liquidity resources are available, how much should be maintained versus how much um, information and how much money um, really should go out to the mission. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about liquidity and availability and why it's important um, in this environment, especially as we've seen things can change so quickly. Um, and really want to talk about what is liquidity. It's really the degree or a, a ability to convert assets easily into cash. Um, it's really defined by how can we get our hands on some cash whenever we need it. Um, of course, you know, everything that we've just been talking about, about the PPP funding has really helped the nonprofit world. Um, and, you know, some of your highly liquid assets, of course, most of you um, understand this, but bank accounts, savings accounts, um, trade accounts that you can easily trade in and convert to cash. And then some of your less liquid assets um, in real estate, privately held stock. And I'm thinking as well, those of you with endowment funds and such where you have large um, portfolios, but they're not really available or they're not liquid in this type of environment. So why is it important for nonprofits? Um, as we mentioned, you know, just the change, I think through all different types of nonprofits, whether it's been the philanthropic world where um, there was just uncertainty, um, nonprofits were shut down, um, donors may not have been sure about their future, so donations may not have come in as quickly. Of course, in the education world, um, with colleges and universities and even private schools being shut down and um, not knowing whether that tuition would come in, um, just having that available cash um, to meet, you know, upcoming resources. Um, today's donors look at liquidity and making funding decisions. I'm sure a lot of you um, looking through grant applications and making grant applications have, you know, seen um, that. It's always been a hot topic for nonprofits of how much available cash you should keep on hand versus um, what's good to go ahead and you know put back out there into the mission. Um, one of the things that we want to talk about as a measure for financial stability and capacity for the mission of growth is basically being able to have that liquidity on hand. So um, in times like this um, pandemic environment that you're able to continue the mission, that you're able to continue serving those that need um, you know, the resources out there. So some of the things we wanted to talk about just quickly, liquidity and availability, um, the months of unrestricted cash on hand, and we do mention unrestricted cash. Um, it's now termed, of course, um, cash without donor restrictions is the new terminology, but most of you know that by unrestricted cash um, because there's a lot of um, available um, assets 
tied up in temporarily restricted or those with donor restrictions. And then also um, if you have endowment funds that are also tied up um, by those legal restrictions, but you want to look at unrestricted cash on hand, um, determine how many months of operating expenses a nonprofit really has, and then making sure how much money that you have available um, in this unrestricted nature to be able to basically survive in this type of environment. And of course, um, what Jeff just talked about with the PPP funding, that was a, a major help for nonprofit organizations to be able to look at that. Um, we have some calculations up here on the screen of available cash and how it's calculated and such. Um, generally three to six months um, is something that is viewed as favorable for liquidity and availability. Um, but we do know a lot of nonprofits where you really do have to consider um, the amount of um, expenses that you have and what that really looks like to serve um, your nonprofits going forward, how much cash that really means to your nonprofit organization. I'm working yeah, Lisa, yes. Lisa, I might, I, I might just make one comment. Um, over the years, and I, I've been working in this nonprofit environment for a long time now, and then comparing that to our for-profit clients, because I have actually, I have some for-profit clients also. And um, it's very unusual to see a nonprofit organization go out of business. And I know that's not um, unheard of, and it does happen, but it's, it's, it's unusual in my experience because nonprofits in general can reduce expenses when their revenue is, is reduced. And there's a little bit more flexibility when you're um, providing services to just reduce the level of service that you're providing the community in order to survive a uh, financial crisis and just kind of shrink down your organization. And then as things improve and you receive grant funds later or your sources of revenue increase, you can Kind of blow it back up so there is an advantage there in the nonprofit space that you know some um, others do not have that opportunity um, but even with that um, like at least as mentioned you have to pay attention to the expenses because of that but even with that you definitely want to pay attention to the amount of cash on hand and liquidity um, to help you survive the difficult financial times yeah and one other thing i'll add thank you jeff um government funding, um, those of you that have are heavily um, dependent on government funding, um, a lot of you probably know that this with the lag period of getting reimbursed. So that's always something to consider as well. Um, if you're heavily dependent on that, um, it, having those expenses up front, but being able to front those expenses before um, that lag period before you actually get reimbursed for those is something really to consider as well. And that can be very different for different organizations, depending on what type of um, agencies you're working with. Um, working capital ratio really just determines how long a nonprofit should sustain its level of spending. I'm using its net available assets or working capital um, it's reported as the most recently um, filed on the 990. Charity Navigator really looks at working capital. Um, we haven't mentioned this, and I think a lot of you probably know, but there are um, sort of um, standard nonprofit ratios out there that the organization Charity Navigator will take um, from the 990 information tax return and calculate that sort of automatically. And you'll see more sophisticated donors as well going out and calculating um, these ratios, as well as um, granting agencies that are considering whether it's like community foundations or other um, um, organizations where they're giving out large grants um, or calculating a lot of these ratios um, automatically off the information that's publicly available. Um, financial leverage, um, it's really liabilities to your assets. Um, part of the goal in rating the financial performance of a nonprofit is to help donors assess the financial capacity and sustainability of the nonprofit. Um, organizations and other sectors um, might be mindful that they manage their total liabilities in relation to the assets. Um, the ratio is an indicator of an organization's solvency and a long-term um, sustainability, really. Um, really, you're just dividing the nonprofit's liabilities by its total asset yields um, as a percentage. <clears throat> 
And some of the other helpful, useful ratios, debt service coverage, uh, measures operating cash flow available for debt service, principal and interest um, by required annual principal and interest payments may also include um, leases. Um, one thing to consider, I know that a lot of questions have come up, um, particularly in this year with audited financial statements, because the PPP loans in many cases are sitting out there as a liability. Um, and that is well known. Um, and a lot of footnote disclosure you'll see in reading audited financial statements about how those PPP funds work and the forgiveness and such. So we know that banks and other granting agencies are factoring that in when they're looking at um, debt service. And then um, operating leverage measures the percent of debt payments can include um, material lease obligations as a percentage of um, operating revenue or unrestricted operating revenue. It answers how much flexibility there is in the operations for debt service or other fixed cost. And then some of the quantitative information about liquidity and availability. Um, yeah, as we mentioned, there's a lot of different rating agencies out there that are looking at various different um, ratios and aspects of nonprofits. But some of the other information to think about, availability may be affected by the nature of the assets, external limits imposed by donors, laws, contracts, um, and other things, and then internal limits imposed by boards. And some of those examples, of course, when we talk about with donor restrictions or your old terminology of temporary restricted net assets, um, making sure that you know those funds have been donated or granted um, with a specific purpose um, or for a specific um, time period. And then of course, all those that are perpetual in nature, like your endowment funds, that by law, um, you know, can't be spent, but just the, um, you know, in accordance with the spending policy. So those are all things to consider as well when you're looking at um, cash and investments and what's truly available to the nonprofit. And then also the other thing to consider the internal limits um, by a board. Many times there are unrestricted or um, assets without donor restrictions where the board places basically a designation on those funds. It could be for reserves for repair and maintenance in the future for capital assets. It could be a, like a quasi endowment where it's not truly a legal endowment, but they've set aside funds for scholarships or other purposes. Um, things to consider there. Um, the board, it, they're truly not restricted by nature, but the board can make decisions on whether making those uh, or could make those available in the future. So those are things to look at as well, things um, for management and the board to consider in times um, like what we just went through with the pandemic of whether there are additional funds that could be used um, to help the nonprofit through difficult times. Um, some of the qualitative information um, on how a nonprofit management manages its liquid resources available to meet the cash needs. Um, for general expenditures within one year of the balance sheet. Um, there is, um, most of you know, um, there's a new footnote required for all nonprofit organizations called liquidity and availability of financial um, resources. Um, it used to not be required for nonprofits, but it is a required footnote now. And um, up on your screen there, you just see an example. There's many different ways um, many different examples of how this could look, but it is a required disclosure in financial statements, um, just depicting in your financial statements the availability and liquidity of a nonprofit, and also the commentary, um, some of the things we just talked about, whether there's assets that are um, designated by a board, um, endowment spending, what those policies look like, the piece of that that can be used in the future. And then financial reporting, how should um, my nonprofit be maintaining its books? Just wanted to briefly mention, you know, it's more important now than ever having um, important detailed financial information, not only um, to be able to obtain new resources, but for these um, different ERC credits and PPP funding, um, you're really reporting, you know, internally. So management and the board can make sound financial decisions about those things we just talked about. And then of course, externally, 
um, because of financial institution decisions, donors, grantors, and others. It's just more important now than ever to maintain sound, detailed um, books and records within your organization. And then lastly, we were just going to talk um, just a moment about the importance of budgeting in the post-COVID um, environment and what's changed. Um, it's more important than ever. Um, we tied budgeting into um, how, you know, liquidity, availability, what that looks like, um, and not just setting a budget at the beginning of the year. I think it's important to talk about, you know, that that's a kind of a fluid document. And as things change, being able to adjust, like what Jeff mentioned earlier, um, nonprofits have that ability to expand and contract very quickly um, with, um, you know, their resources. So budgeting is more important and keeping that a fluid document and considering um, all those alternative resources. And Jeff, I don't know if you had anything to add to um, that piece about budgeting. Yeah, and I'll, I'll comment too on the slide before that about financial statements. Um, we do a lot of audit work and it is not that common to have accurate financial reporting. And just from a governance standpoint, um, it's hard to govern. Um, it's hard for your finance committee to make good decisions. It's hard for your board to make good decisions. Um, it's hard really to um, dictate your future and plan on what resources you have in order to fulfill your mission without having good financial reporting. And I know it's not like an exciting thing to talk about and it's a difficult thing um, to actually accomplish because it takes qualified people to keep your books and records. Um, it keeps, it, it requires a decent accounting system. Um, it, it requires oversight on a regular basis. And um, from just a pure governance standpoint, now that we're in this post um, environment, it's even more important because things are changing constantly and they're probably going to continue to change, you know, in the near future. And you need to have good financial information to make decisions. And um, I, I just can't emphasize that enough. And we, we see on a regular basis where we're coming in and doing an audit and we'll make numerous very material adjustments where the information the finance committee and board was using all year long really was not accurate and it, it could cause some bad decisions. So um, just from a pure governance standpoint, it's something that you really want to focus on. And then um, also in regard to budgeting, um, first of all, um, you need to do it. So there's a surprising number of nonprofits that do not do it at all. And you just think about yourself personally. You kind of know personally how much money I take in you know, what my expenses are and if I'm going to have anything left over. And a nonprofit needs to be able to know the same thing, except it's a little more difficult sometimes, especially the larger you get to know that without going through this budgeting process. And a budget is a big deal because it causes conversations. It causes a conversation when you're designing the budget because you might um, see that, oh, we're going to spend more money than we're taking in. What do we do? How do we fix that? Um, it causes a discussion with your finance committee and board when they see that, okay, I've got this one line item for a budget and we actually have done this, which is different than what we budgeted. Why did that happen? And it might be negative or positive. We might have spent more money than we anticipated. We might have spent less. And then you can make a decision about what are we going to do with that extra money? But the big thing is, the budget um, allows for oversight and it allows for discussions and planning and just the ability to um, change in this environment and kind of try to plan the best you can around these new sources of revenue that we've been talking about, future new sources of revenue. And um, it's just a very important process. And it might be, I think some people argue it's probably the most important thing you can do from a financial standpoint. And oftentimes it's not done well. It's, um, it's not really used well enough. And, um, and oftentimes it's just not done at all. So um, that's kind of our, you know, my main comments on that. So I think we had one question and it was about the amend amending of 941s. And yes, you do have to do that um, on paper, but like I mentioned earlier, I was pleasantly surprised at 
how fast the IRS is turning around those amended 941s. It must be a priority because once again, this is a stimulus program, this employee retention credit program. And um, there must be, they're aware that this money needs to get out there. And I'm guessing that all sorts of other paperwork is stacking up and then that's a priority. So I wouldn't really consider that to be a barrier from what I've seen the, the money turns around very quickly. So thanks everybody for listening to the um, kind of the financial part of um, governance in this post pandemic environment. And now we're going to, we're going to kind of change, you know, what we're talking about and we're um, excited to have Bonnie Schumann, co-founder and retired CEO of Stratix Corporation, join us for an engaging discussion with Jeff Jowdy. I know I always en enjoy Jeff's interviews, um, kind of brings out interesting um, things, you know, from the people that he talks to. And after the interview with Bonnie, we'll hear from Lighthouse Council Senior Consultant, Karen Kemp. Thank you, everyone. effective nonprofit leadership summit to have a conversation with uh, one of my best friends, a lady who I hold in the highest regard and have learned so much uh, from Bonnie Schumann. Bonnie, we're just delighted to have you. And I know that our seminar participants are, are looking forward to your, to your wisdom. So um, you're coming to us from St. Simon's, a great spot. I wish we could be there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm blessed to live here. It's great. Well, to to our to our uh, participants today, Bonnie uh, Schumann is a very successful and distinguished businesswoman who has dedicated the last few years of her uh, life in, in in true public service. And and what a what a great success story. Bonnie is the retired CEO of Stratix Corporation, a company that she helped co-found, and in 1983 and sold in 2011 and when when you go to home depot or any of these big retailers and look at all these shelves and these barcodes and and uh, employees scanning and barcoding i always think uh, of my friend bonnie schumann who was a pioneer in that industry uh, and uh, worked with uh, industries and companies to establish their bar barcode guidelines uh, she's conducted numerous seminars that focus on the benefits of barcoding and other automatic data uh, capture technology. She was primarily responsible for the content uh, of a guide to barcoding, which is recognized as a leading reference manual to those interested in utilizing automatic data capture. So a very successful uh, businesswoman and a pioneer in, in a field that uh, now is was everywhere, but certainly was not when when, when Body uh, co-founded Stratix. Uh, she's a past president of the Automatic Data Capture Trade Association. She's a former board member of the Women in Packaging and the Georgia Women's Business Council. Uh, she's served as chair of the Frederica Academy Board of Trustees. She's on the executive committee of the Communities of Coastal Georgia Foundation and is treasurer of the UGA uh, foundation uh, board of trustees and I was fortunate to to get to know Bonnie when she was uh, a leader and eventual president of the UGA Alumni Association um, and she's also a treasurer of Christ Church uh, Frederica so Bonnie again welcome to this conversation we're just grateful to our listeners you'll soon soon know when I say that that Bonnie uh, is a force of nature and brings lots of enthusiasm and wisdom and insight and uh, and and is, is known uh, to achieve great things. And so we're just excited to get your insight on the nonprofit arena that you're primarily, primarily focused on, on now, it seems. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Jeff. Very flattering. And I appreciate that. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about anything that's of interest, hopefully um, can share some insight and, yeah. and, um, share what I can. So we'll see. How about what, um, when you look at the great success story that, that Stratix was, what, what principles do you feel have led to your success uh, in the corporate world and, and now in the nonprofit arena? Well, some things overlap. Some in, in many cases seem distinct, but um, I guess the things that overlap really are uh, fundamentals that, 
you know, my parents taught me, and that was just to try to treat others the way you want, want to be treated. Uh, and the business perspective, um, you know, a book that was very popular in my early days was The One Minute Manager. And it was all about, you know, taking your shoes off and try to walk in other people, try to understand what they're doing. So that was really key to um, our success was trying to understand what our customers' needs were, what their business challenges were, and then what solutions we could offer them that would help them be successful. So it was all about relationship building, trying to understand what their needs were, and um, then trying to exceed them. And, and that was, again, a, a, I think a principle that my parents taught me, a lot of hard work. And um, that's what we demonstrated. And that's what our core culture was all about, is what could we do to exceed our customers' expectations. I think some of that bleeds over to the non profit and that is understanding you know what the mission of your organization is and then what can you do to convey that and, and so it's, it's you know some of that bleeds over some it sounds a little different from a from a for-profit versus a nonprofit but fundamentally relationship building it, it is the same anywhere and it's trying to understand what your donors you know what what do they want to hear about what to what do they you think is going to resonate with them in terms of them understanding your mission and whole bit. So some of it bleeds over, some's a little different, but um, that hard work you can't um, overlook certainly and um, relationship. One of my um, early mentors, uh, a gentleman named Lewis Timberlake wrote a couple great, great books and we had him come speak to our company a couple times. Uh, sadly he's passed away, but his, this line, stuck with me forever and it's uh no one knows how much care no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care um and that that's a big one you know it's um doesn't matter what kind of solutions you can offer until they understand do you really care about what my what my worries are you know do you really understand so it's a it's a fundamental relationship kind of kind of answer that's, that's that, that interesting that common theme as you shared of, of relationships you've finally certainly been successful by any standard in the in the for-profit arena and in the non-profit arena how does bonnie schumann define success well you know what that's um that has certainly changed a great deal over the years um but on the personal and on the, my professional journey you know, in the early days, professionally, it was what did we need to do to keep our doors open? You know, what, um, uh, you know, um, income could we generate so that we could <laughs> make payroll? And there were many times that that was a challenge. So the measure of success for us, um, for me professionally, gr varied a great deal over, over the years. Uh, now, personally, my success is do I have the freedom to use um, use my time the way I want to use it? Um, so uh, I answered to a different measure years ago. I've now been retired for 10 years, uh, which I cannot believe it's been that long. It's just flown by. So it's do I, um, am I allowed, you know, can I do the things I want to do with my time and with my resources um, that I feel good about. And, and again, that still varies a little bit um, time to time where I feel different stresses in the whole bit, but success for me is having that freedom to make those choices and, um, feel good when I put my head on the pillow at night that, that I have, um, <laughs> um, I guess honored all those appropriately. This same mentor, uh, this Lewis Timberlake gave us an example, um, on how to kind of, um, check that periodically. And he defined, he said, you know, define your life as this, as a pie, um, as one example, if, if a pie appeals to, if you don't have a sweet tooth, maybe you'll want it to be a pizza, whatever, whatever is your barometer. But looking at that pie and saying, am I, um, if I had to slice it up, so define all the things that are important for you. And this is going to, it's going to change from time to time, both professionally you know, and, and personally, but let's just say, um, this is the January of 2021. Here's my pie. And what are the important things I want? Is it, um, is it a relationship? 
uh, is that I have a personal relationship, be it a spouse, significant other, or maybe it's just friends. Um, I ha- if I have a spiritual component of my life that's important, whether it be a church or whatever else is important to you, is there an exercise component? Is there a professional component? Whatever the pieces of the pie that are important to your life. And if you had to slice it up and, and evaluate, do you feel like you're slicing it up the way you want to do it? You know, is it, is it the fact that you're not doing enough for this piece of the pie that you want and you want that to be more just look at that look at your life as that piece of pie that pe- or that pie or that pizza and are you comfortable on the way those slices look and if you're not you feel like you're not being a good friend or you're not going to church or whatever it is that you you know is important if you're not giving it all you're all at work you know what's missing what's what is what's not being addressed properly. Um, and, and he really encouraged that to be a periodic check. And, and so I do that kind of mentally still, you know, am I not being, you know, um, a, a good spouse? Am I not being a good mother? That whole bit. And I still do that from time to time, even though I don't have the pressure. But back when work was too much of my pie, it was important for me to say, okay, let's Let's bring that more in check. Let's try to get exercise more addressed. Let's try to be a better friend or acknowledge that, you know what, uh, you know, work is at this point in my life, three quarters of my pie. And, you know, (laughs) that's just the way it is right now. And feel good about it. You know, don't stress out about it. Acknowledge this is just where I am right now. And I'll, you know, try to get let those other little slivers understand that this too shall pass, you know. So um, I still do that. It's an important kind of gut check for me. And, um, you know, it, it's it's something that um, I, I think is, I encourage others, you know, um, a big term in my early days of working was work-life balance because I, I did marry have two children and ran a company with a lot of employees that were also my children. So um, I felt oftentimes, you know, people would say, how do you, how do you manage this work life balance? And I said, well, the first thing that I think is important to acknowledge is that balance is an impossible standard because balance to me is a very temporary. What do you think of when you think of balance, like a seesaw? or scales or something and look how temporary that is and how difficult it is to get a seesaw to be balanced. A better job, a better terminology, I think is work-life juggle and a good juggler drops some things and it's okay. You know what? It's all right. One day I'm not going to make dinner and, you know, I'm not going to single carpool pickup and I'm not because I'm going to drop a few balls and it's okay. A good juggler drops some balls and moves on and is there to juggle another day. And I think that's a standard um, that's a much more appropriate one because I think balance, work-life balance for folks sometimes is is just an almost impossible standard. So um, that's a very long explanation, Jeff. Sorry. I'm no, that, that, that. no um, <laughs> that's how, how, how impactful the work. Yeah. The work life juggle, and I love that. What a what a great, great terminology. Well, Bonnie, with your with your volunteering and your giving spirit, you have certainly uh, made an impact with your philanthropy. What has inspired your philanthropic journey? Well, um, honestly, um, my parents taught me early on, simply from just a tithing perspective that that was an important part. And that was probably the kind of the limit of what they did. I was one of four children. We had very modest upbringing and it, they worked real hard to make sure that all four of us went to college, got a college education because neither of them had had, had that opportunity. So that was a huge sacrifice that they made, but along the way, they still were very good tithers at church. And, and that was probably my first introduction to, you know, saving dimes and then dollars to make sure that we put that in the plate. And that was it. Uh, my other introduction or probably my next step up in terms of real introduction, because I really didn't have much else growing up was um, when I got to college and our sorority had a national philanthropy that we 
it was a very important part of what we did. And probably my first real introduction to both hands-on work and cash out. So it was not only fundraising, but also actually showing up and, and helping. So um, I, 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 that was an important lesson and, and probably part of, I was fortunate enough to be a leader. So we got some leadership training through my sorority that was, I think, um, important. So I got to understand that kind of got another spark in me, um, gave me an example of even if you don't have the financial resources to always put that behind a cause, being able to participate was fulfilling to me. And, uh, and I liked that. And so when, when we started um, Stratix, which was actually started as Barcode Systems, we changed our name to Stratix. That was actually one of the important things that we put into our culture was that ability to give back and to support that. So we had um, casual for a cause. You could, even though people are used to dressing casually now in the business arena back in the yeah, early 80s, you know, we dressed up every day. But we gave people the opportunity if they wanted to dress down on Friday and not have to dress up, they could donate, make a donation, and we would establish a, we'd have a, we had a little committee that established our quarterly, what our charity was of choice, and the money that we raised by dressing casually, casually for a cause was given to the charity. So um, it was important for me to be able, again, to encourage others to be able to support philanthropy. Um, So I I think, um, again, probably college was my first real introduction to um, being able to participate, and and it just grew from there, honestly. Bonnie, over the last decade, what changes have you seen in in the nonprofit arena and with the organizations that you're involved with? Well, it's hard for me to make uh, probably a blanket observation. I'll talk about the ones that I've seen locally um, that, can you hear my dog in the background? I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you'll have to you'll have to introduce him or her to our Yeah, to our yeah. I'll show you here in a second. Sorry about that. You know, it's only it's only when you get on a on something you need to record that your dog decides that he needs to be needy. Um, so it's hard for me to make a blanket observation about nonprofits. I, I have the luxury just of, of what we see locally, uh, primarily. I, I was on the grant making committee of our community foundation, which which gave me some real um, insight to nonprofits. And um, our community foundation covers McIntosh County, Glen County, and Camden County. So the three counties here on the coast. And so um, a, c- a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting. Um, one is that we've seen a lot more, I would say, accountability, a lot more um, need or, or desire from donors to understand what's really kind of going on behind the curtains that um, that I think has been good um, at the end of the day, because I think that that has encouraged these nonprofits to really step up the game in terms of what they're doing and how they explain their mission and and how do they properly um, execute against their mission. Um, One of the things that we've encouraged from the Community Foundation is to these nonprofits to be very um, uh, transparent in terms of if they get a grant, how do they use their grant? How is it impactful? And I think what that has done is, is encourage nonprofits to, to make sure they're executing and, and holding themselves more accountable than they did in the past. So I think that's a, um, that has been a, a, a great, we've seen, seen improvement in that over the, the years that we've been doing um, local grants. I think what I'm disappointed in probably is that we've tried to encourage nonprofits to work together in um, trying to use the old analogy of one plus one equals three, you know, is it, is it, um, and by doing that, um, opening themselves up for more grants and the like. So, for example, we have a real issue in coastal Georgia with literacy and, um, and, you know, um, the facts have demonstrated that if, if you can um, get children or try to, um, address the reading early in the early years 
it, the, the trickle effect in terms of what it means in terms of dropouts and, and all other kinds of issues is greatly diminished. So we try to encourage nonprofits to work together. So for instance, we have a, a grandparent um, connection. So our one of the local groups um, offers child, child care for grandparents, you know, support so that the children that are being kept by grandparents can 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 be introduced to reading. We can get them books and things like that that they are missing in many cases because they're so worried about child care they don't get to address all these other things. Well, we were hoping that if we could get the grandparents group and the Boys and Girls Club and the library and all these groups to work together, that it would help the three um, all benefit. But we, we still see too many of them working in silos and just dealing with their mission. And I know that's in many cases is so overwhelming, but we were hoping that some of these nonprofits could work together to be more impactful. And we, we just haven't seen that happen much here, which is somewhat disappointing. But again, putting myself in their shoes, I know that they're often so tasked with just doing what their sole mission is that stepping outside that is often often really challenging. But um, overall, I think the greatest um, nonprofit success or what I've seen the greatest trend is just more attention to strategic planning and trying to, to um, really get the right board members in place and supportive of what they're doing. And I, that's, a, that's very inspiring and, and encouraging for sure. Bonnie, you've, you've started, grew, led a, a very successful, large for-profit, and you've been involved in, in so many nonprofits, again, from those in Atlanta to the University of Georgia to, to uh, where you live today on the coast. What is the biggest difference between uh, running a nonprofit and a for-profit? What, what has struck well, you? Is- yeah, yeah. Um, as for me, the, you know, the metrics are usually different. Um, our for-profit, obviously, was we didn't have a choice. Um, the, the bottom line is we needed to have, uh, a, you know, a significant profit to be able to pay taxes, to be able to financially reward our employees because um, once you had a trained employee, you wanted to make sure you could keep a trained employee. So you always had to look at what incentive packages. And we wanted to be able to grow too. So the the money, the, the profits that we generated, we wanted to put back and be able to expand so that we can continue to, you know, we started as a very, um, in the beginning, kind of a Georgia centric, and then it was Southeast centric, and then we took our footprint across the US. So we wanted to be able, to generate profits to be able to do that. Whereas the nonprofit side, you know, I've worked with, it is, is very much, a, you know, if, if we can break even, then that is success, you know, um, if we are addressing our, our mission. In fact, we don't even mind if we come out of the bank and don't have enough money if we feel like we're still addressing what our mission is. Um, that's fine. So um, two different barometers of what makes you feel good. Um, um, what makes you feel good in that for-profit arena is definitely money in the bank to be able to do what you want to do. Um, whereas these nonprofits, you know, if we don't have the money in the bank, but we're still whatever, you know, providing books for children or, you know, whatever it is, we feel good about that. So, you know, two different kind of um, things that keep you up at night, I guess. That's awesome. Bonnie, I'd love to get your thoughts now on, on your, uh, experiences as a donor and as a board member. So as a donor, and um, certainly no need to mention the organizations unless you want to, but what has your best giving experience been as a donor? Um, Probably when you feel like you've impacted someone personally, you know, um, we have um, given funds to to scholarships and been able to meet scholarship recipients and um, for them to be able to personally tell you what a difference it it has made for them to be able to be in college and and you to feel like you had a big part in that is is very very rewarding so to have that personal um, kind of feedback has certainly been impactful for sure but you know it doesn't always have to be that one-on-one because 
I hope to think that most of the the organizations we support that I believe enough in their mission that if even if I see a holistic response in that regard, I don't have to have the one-on-one contact to feel good about it. I believe enough in the organization to say, okay, I know that I'm doing this in a big picture way. So I don't have to have that one-on-one contact to, to feel good about supporting a group. Um, I hope that um, for me to get to that point that I believe enough in the mission and say, okay, I know that I'm touching that. Um, so if, if the nonprofit's done the right type of messaging and the right type of um, telling the story, then I can get that in a very big picture way as well. But probably the best is when you do feel like you, you know, I've had that one-on-one to say, thank you, Bonnie, for making this difference for me, which is, you know, certainly kind of a goosebump kind of thing for me, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I was going to ask you about your worst experience, but I think instead to be more positive uh, based on your experiences and what you've learned and observe, are there two or three suggestions, recommendations that you would make to nonprofits on how they should deal with, interact with donors? Well, I mean, certainly um, it it is uh, handwritten notes are really a, a great touch because it gives you that personal and I really don't have any worse stories because um, I, I, I've been fortunate enough that um, with the exception of, you know, uh, just a token small donation, just to either, you know, for just a basic call that I've not really called to in a small thing. I don't, I don't expect anything special, but when there is something that above and beyond my handwritten notes are a great touch phone calls are a great touch, something that makes it feel a little more personal. First time donors, particularly, I think um, it's nice to be recognized as something rather than just be, you know, um, here we go again. So anything that is um, singled out, um, I I think is, is a nice touch, you know, um, and acknowledging that, um, you know, that the that the mission has been addressed and that sort of thing. I, I love your insight earlier about the the pizza and then the the balance. Um, uh, I know that you're engaged on several boards right now, and and uh, and you probably have a lot more opportunities to serve. What do you look for when you're making that decision that, yes, I want to serve on, on this organization's board? Um, yeah, fundamentally, do I believe in the mission? You know, I've had been asked to join some boards that just aren't at the top of my radar in terms of, of what I really care about. And um, so, I, and I'm very candid to say, you know what, I am so flattered to be asked right now, but I don't think I have the time um, because I don't want to 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 make that <laughs> that pie for me. I do have a sweet tooth, so it's a pie for me. Um, uh, yeah, the pie can only be so big, and um, so I have been real honest about you know time commitment number one. But before I get to the time, it's do I believe in the mission, and is that where I want to to put my time and energy? Um, beyond that, it's. Um, who is their paid leadership and, and do I have confidence in that leader and what they're doing? And do I do, do I feel like they're the right, the right leader at the right time for, in this case, it's, uh, I'll say community for us. Then I look at their prior board members. Do I believe that, that they've done a good job? Who are their current board members? Uh, do I want to serve with them as well? I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. And then, um, you know, I ask, what are their expectations? Uh, and I think it's real important. And I've learned that. I didn't, the first couple of boards I joined, I had no clue what was the expectation of, uh, about uh, serving. And I think as a board member, too, that I, on the other side, I think we've learned better before we ask, you know, having a sheet. Okay, here's an expectation of being a board member. You know, here are here's how often we meet. Here's... Uh, what we expect from a financial support situation, the whole bit. So I think we've done better in doing that. And, and I would expect being asked to, to, for that to be laid out for me very clearly as well. So 
Um, I think those are the biggies. I don't think I've missed anything there. And then, Bonnie, what do you, uh, as you've evolved and served on more and more boards, uh, what are the two or three most important things that you would expect from a nonprofit as a board member? What what should nonprofits be doing for their board to make that a great experience? Well, certainly it's that clear expectation of service. I, I think that is absolutely required. You know, what for me to be a board member, what is it you need? Um, very a clear mission uh, and plan uh, for how you're going to execute against that mission. So I want to see a strategic plan. I want to know what's what's expected there. And then transparency in terms of um, what's really going on there. And, and for me to understand, if you want me to support the mission, tell me what's really going on. So I think those are the probably the top two or three. Transparency, uh, clear-cut mission and execution against that, and then expectations of service. What do you want for me as a board member? Great. Bonnie, our, our, our last, last question would be, uh, with that nonprofit board theme, uh, you've been a nonprofit board chair, and I know I've seen you in action. You're phenomenal. But what would you? What recommendations, if if uh, if for either the nonprofit staff that are participating today, or we have some nonprofit board chairs that are with us, what would you suggest? What are some of the things that would make a very successful nonprofit board chair? What should he or she be doing, thinking about? Well, I think it's. Um, very much understanding, making sure that you're in sync with the, the paid leadership. Um, so it's, it's understanding that, that there's good communication, that, that there's discussion on um, are we both staying in our own lane and do what we're supposed to be doing in our lane. You know, um, it, it is um, making sure you're on the same page in terms of mission and execution against that mission. Um, from a board chair, uh, for me, it was um, making sure that we had the right board members, and I felt like um, that was a real um, important role in, in helping that recruitment of the right board members and making sure that they understood their role and were and were um, performing that role properly. You know, um, depending on what. What um, board you're on, obviously, it differs a little bit via school or a church or a nonprofit, you know, uh, um, in, in the community. Everybody has slightly a different thing. But I, I felt as board chair a, a real um, um, responsibility that that everybody's playing properly, if you will, in the same sandbox. So, um, you know, I, I, those are the, the biggies, I think. And, and it's com communication with the, the paid leadership, I think, is the big key in making sure that that's all, um, that is where the term balance is, is appropriate, that that is in, in check properly, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Bonnie, I, I always learn from you. This has been a, a, a great conversation. Oh. I know our our participants with the Effective Nonprofit Leadership Summit have as well. So thank you so much, my friend, for your leadership. Well, listen, uh, I'm flattered. Well, it's, it's been great, and, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Karen Kemp, and I'm just delighted to just delighted to be with you this morning. I'm with Lighthouse Council and I'm excited to be here to talk to you today about constituents. But before we get started, I'm sorry to tell you that my dear friend and colleague, Karen Baldwin, could not be with us today. Uh, Karen is former vice president at the University of Alabama and her insight is so valuable. So we promise she will be here next time. Uh, but our very best to her this morning. And today you'll get one Karen instead of two. So again, I'm so glad to be here. And this is one of my favorite subjects. Many years ago, when I first began working in nonprofit, I heard the term constituents and I didn't really understand how significantly that would impact not only me, but the agencies and nonprofits I served over the years. So today we're going to talk about who your constituents are, why they're important and how you can deepen your relationship with them. You know, your organization's constituents are like your family. They're your inner circle. 
They're the best source for donations, for advice and counsel, for insight. They're your best ambassadors. There we go. Thank you for your patience while I catch up. This is a photograph I absolutely love, and it's a photograph of U.S. Senator Johnny Isaacson with U.S. Representative John Lewis, just two giants in the state of Georgia, and sadly, Representative Lewis is not with us anymore, but this photo was taken on the floor of the Senate when Johnny Isaacson was retiring after many years of service there. And much was made over the fact that these two people of very different perspectives came together and worked so tirelessly on behalf of the state of Georgia and all Americans. And the interesting thing, some people said, well, it was because they both had such a shared love of Georgia. Well, I think everyone in this state would agree that there was a tremendous love for Georgia on both of their parts. But I would say it said more about their character and their willingness to be authentic and real and personal with each other. You know, if you ever had the opportunity to spend any time with Johnny, you would hear him say this over and over again. There are two types of people in this world, friends and future friends. So today I want to challenge you to think about friends and future friends, the friends that you have and the friends that you'd like to make. Now in philanthropy, if I ask you to say, you know, what pops into your head when somebody says philanthropy? Well, I'm guessing if you're like 99% of us, you're going to think money. But philanthropy is about way more than big checks. It's about relationships. So I would challenge you today to ask yourself some questions. Bring your team together. Uh, if you work in higher ed, what a great time to sit down with your president, the executive team, your advancement staff, in a smaller nonprofit, the same thing. Bring your team together and say, what are we doing to really enhance our relationship with our constituents? Are we doing enough? What could we do better? How can we create deeper relationships? And how are we going to recruit and retain new constituents? So let's talk for a minute just to make sure we're all clear about what a constituent actually is. So you can see here uh, what the certified fundraising executive team thinks constituents are. So they're people who have been involved with your organization, members, contributors, board members, clients, relatives. I'm sure there are others that you could add to that list. What about um, volunteers and past volunteers? I think one important group, particularly for those of you who may serve in the human services sector is clients. Clients are constituents as well. So let's talk a little bit about this model. I think this reminds me very much of the university model of fundraising where you see uh, you know, the alumni in the outer circle, but these concentric circles represent groups of constituents. And the closer you are to the center of the circle, the closer you are to those people. For example, those at the center already give freely of their time and their resources. And then once you get to the outer rings of the circle, those would be the people who are more loosely engaged with you. But each circle must be treated uniquely and with a lot of care to maximize their engagement and to enhance their commitment to your organization. This model is a powerful fundraising tool and an engagement tool for finding those most committed to your organization. And it can also help you identify future constituencies. Who are the people you want to engage with that you maybe have not at this point? So what exactly is engagement? Well, it's trying to get organizations and individuals to participate in your work in a meaningful way. I think it's particularly important you see the images on the screen right now when you talk about food banks or uh, I mentioned human services organizations, extremely important 
to get people engaged in hands-on work. And we see a good visual of that here. So why does it matter? I've been asked that question before, and, and candidly, I've had um, CEOs of organizations I served that needed a little help being convinced that constituent engagement matters, but it matters very much. One of the reasons it matters is the cost of replacing existing donors with new donors is very high. It's a lot better value to keep the donors you have who are more likely to give and give you more based on three things. The constituent feels acknowledged. They believe your nonprofit is well run and they believe their gift makes a difference. Now, how will they know these things? The only way they'll know it is if you share it and you tell them. So constituent engagement leads to donor retention. The other thing I think is very important is feedback. How often do you ask your constituents for their feedback? You know how you think you're doing and how your staff thinks you're doing. You probably know how your board thinks you're doing. But what about others in those other circles that we talked about? Do they know? Do you know how they think you're doing? Those are important questions to ask yourself. And I think as you think about engagement and whether you're really committed, one of the most important things that you have to be willing to do is this third bullet you see here. Are you willing to play the long game with constituents? I want to tell you a short story about a colleague that worked for a brain injury foundation. He had been at this foundation for many years and a person who is in his personal and professional life, just known for his authenticity and his kindness. And he had met a donor and known her for about 10 years. And over that period of time, he had gone from just, you know, writing her a note or picking up the phone now and then to taking her to lunch once a year. It was something they both looked forward to. And it was a special time they would share. He got to know her family. He knew her passions. And he also talked a lot about her grandchildren, which were extremely important to her. And in that, over that period of 10 years, he had been, she had been a steady four figure donor. She'd give about a thousand dollars annually and look forward to their annual visits. But the wonderful thing about this development officer was he cared about her and she knew that. Well, an interesting thing happened one day. He was sitting in his office and his assistant walked in and said that this lady was there to see him. And he immediately told me that he felt alarmed because she had never been to his office. She had never uh, shown up unannounced. So she was ushered into his office and sat down and he said, I'm just so glad you're here. Is everything OK? And she didn't say anything. She just reached out and she slid a white envelope across the desk and said, open it. And when he did, there was a seven figure gift in that envelope. Now, I'm not suggesting that it always works that way, but I can tell you that playing the long game and being authentic and being personal led to a gift that was life changing for that development officer and for that organization and for her. And the interesting thing, when I asked him, I said, what happened then? He said, we both cried. So how do you engage constituents? Well, that story sets us up for this first bullet, and that's be authentic and be personal. Be willing to get to know your constituents. Find out about their families. Find out about what they care about and talk to them about that. You know, one of the things that we talk about communication, look for unique ways to meet them where they are. One of the things that one of my colleagues, Jeff Jowdy, is so good about is acknowledging birthdays and anniversaries. And if something shows up in the newspaper, in a magazine, clipping that out and sending it to someone. These are powerful ways to engage with your constituents. Now we have the best time in life to share information and stay in touch. You know, I think back to when I began as a development officer. I'm not going to tell you when that was. 
But let me say we did not have uh, email at the time or LinkedIn or Google or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It was a little harder to communicate then, but I'm telling you now we have no excuse. There are so many ways that we can engage with our constituents and communicate effectively. We might say, how do you communicate effectively? If you have one takeaway from this today, I hope you'll remember this one thing. Tell the best stories, practice, get comfortable with telling stories that are personal about your organization. The most successful people I know that work in the nonprofit arena are great storytellers. And that is the key. And be deliberate about that. Whatever your organization is, whether it's your college and you're collecting stories on successful scholarship students or athletes or graduates, or you're in a human services arena and you can talk about someone's life who was changed because they learned to read or their family was fed at a time when they were not able to do that. So tell those stories and figure out where your constituents are and make sure you're there as well. Now, it's, I want to restate <clears throat> an old adage, failure to plan is planning to fail. That's kind of our family motto because my husband is a Marine and every morning he gets up and says, what's the plan for today? Uh, I laugh at that and I often get frustrated by it, but I will tell you that it makes sense. It takes planning to retain those who love you and to reach out to those who want to love you. Make your board feel like the heroes in the story of your nonprofit. You know, get them engaged in a way that they are so passionate about your mission and the work that you're doing that they will go to their peers. There is nothing more powerful than having a peer go out on behalf of your organization. You know, we often in the development field have to recognize that we get paid to do this work. Board members and friends of your organizations do it because they care, because they're passionate. So make that work for you. It's the right thing to do. And people want to be involved with organizations that are making things happen in the world. You know, it's interesting to me. I sometimes see fundraising materials that talk about how bad things are. You know, we just need the money. We're really struggling right now. You know, I want to make my personal investments with places that are making things happen. So make sure, particularly in light of the recent pandemic, <clears throat> that you use storytelling and connect the dots for your constituents, that lives are being changed by virtue of the work that you're doing. So one more thing, build trust. That seems so obvious, but always, always do what you say you will do. One of the way you build trust is to go back to what I just said, is have the right people talking to the right people. Trust is built when someone that you know comes to you and shares their passion. Friends asking friends is absolutely the most powerful way to do it. And be grateful. Follow through on your promises. If you say you're going to do something, do it. If you can't do it in a timely way, reach out and let them know it. Thank people quickly and thank people often. It still surprises me after decades in this business how many times I talk to potential donors and they say, I didn't get a thank you for my $5,000 check last year or my $500 check last year. It's absolutely critical that you thank people and thank them quickly. I think it's important to have something in place that in your organization, when I worked in college development, we'd had a policy of 24 hours after the receipt of it, of a gift, a thank you and an acknowledgement went out. So the more you share your story and bring your tribe together and enlist their help, the more excitement you will generate and the more engaged people will be. So what does it look like? Back to that discussion about planning, it's absolutely essential that you have a constituent engagement plan. 
You've got to prioritize touching base with these constituents and figure out how you do it so it's not haphazard. We recommend at a minimum for your closest friends of your organization, seven times per year you should touch them. Maybe that's a thank you letter. Maybe it's a personal visit. Maybe you're going to take them to lunch. Maybe it's an email when you see that their child just got accepted to the college of their choice. Whatever those things are, make sure you're doing it and doing it frequently. Another quick story of one of my favorite philanthropists. She was an extraordinary woman who built an extraordinary company and made a lot of money. And not only did she make a lot of money, she gave a tremendous amount of money away. And when I was at a working in college development as the director of development, the president of our institution asked me to go out and have a meeting this, with this woman. She and I met so many times. We had lunch together. I would pick her up and take her shopping and we became fast friends, but she never wrote checks to our college. Now she wrote massive checks to the University of Georgia, which wasn't even her alma mater. And she wrote checks to her alma mater uh, in an Ivy League college as well. And my president was getting extremely frustrated about the fact that she never wrote us a check. So he had an idea of something that was important, he thought, on our campus and asked me to reach out to her. So I did. And I shared, took her to lunch, and I shared what our need was and asked her if she would be able to meet that need. And she said, nope, nope, don't care about that. That's not my passion. So we continued to have lunch, and I thanked her for her time, and we talked about all kinds of fun things. And as I was about to go, I said, I need to leave a few minutes early because I have to go meet a moving truck. And she said, well, what are they moving? I said, they're moving a Steinway into the college. And she said, well, why are they doing that? And I said, well, we don't have a Steinway and we have this artist in residence that's coming. We don't have a piano at all um, that would be suitable for him to play. So we have to rent this from another state. It actually came out of the state of Florida and have it brought up here. And she said, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I said, well, you know, they're just extremely expensive. And we felt that the caliber of this person, it should be a Steinway grand piano. So I said goodbye and got back to my office later that afternoon. And she called and she said, swing by the house. I have a check for you. And I said, for what? And she said, I just ordered a Steinway grand piano and it's going to be delivered in about 45 days as soon as they can get it in. So make sure that your touches are relevant to their interest. No matter how many times I tried to give her, get her to give money to student scholarships or student housing or the science program, when she heard that there was not a Steinway for our students and our guest artists to play on, that resonated with her. Figure out what's relevant and what they care about. So let's touch briefly on types of visits. Certainly nothing can take the place of a personal visit. I think we all feel that so strongly right now, having come through the pandemic. And certainly Zoom and Microsoft Teams meetings have made life much better. But at the same time, when you can, a personal visit is so important. Also, are you asking your constituents how they feel about things? Are you regularly serving them? Are you hosting focus groups and town hall meetings? Empowering your dis constituents as decision makers is one of the most important ways you can engage them. So how do you do that? Well, when you bring people on your board, you empower them as decision makers, right? They're in charge of governance. Likewise, are you getting people engaged in in committees and other ways that allows them to be decision makers, when they are responsible for the achievement and the outcome of their activities, they will be so much more engaged with you. Have you ever served on a board of directors that you felt like it was a rubber stamp for what the CEO and the staff had already decided? 
you know, I have served on a couple of boards like that and they were brief periods of service because is that what we really want? Is that fulfilling? I would say that it's not. High performing nonprofits learn early on how to engage their constituents in meaningful ways. And one way to do that is to get them engaged in decision making and in having a positive influence on your organization. I think it's very important as well to personalize your engagement efforts. You know, sometimes when you think about a large university or a large nonprofit or even a small nonprofit, it's like, I don't have the time for all the personal engagement efforts. Well, you've got to make sure that you target each constituency group. I want to give you a recent example where I interviewed a very successful and elderly Atlanta philanthropist. This gentleman is uh, over 90 years old, but still going strong, both professionally and with his philanthropy. And we were doing a study to talk, to find out about his interest in a potential campaign. And it was kind of stunning when he told me that he hadn't heard from this organization in many years. And he said, wow, I'd love to get a letter. Well, that was such a signal to me. I have no doubt that this organization is flooding his inbox, which he probably has one of, but he never sees that. So meet your constituents where they are. Think about their generation, what kinds of things will be appropriate for them. Now, types of engagement. You see here this photograph on the left of Pete Griffin with Musicians on Call, one of our wonderful clients, and they've had a great deal of success with videos. We are all about videos. We think that's a great way to stay in touch. It's inexpensive. It's easy to do. You can have it professionally done or you can do it on your iPhone. But one great way to stay in touch, um, say thank you. Say it often and say it for all the different ways your constituents engage with you. Recognize things like birthdays and anniversaries. Pick up the phone and don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call when there's an opportunity to reach out to one of your constituents. Years ago, I worked for a senator who told me, I did a lot of constituent relations, and one of the things he told me was that he didn't want to see all the mail. He couldn't possibly see all the mail. He said, but make sure you bring me every handwritten note. Well, I thought that was interesting, but he said, if somebody cares enough to write a handwritten note, then we absolutely want to be sure that I see it. And he wrote a handwritten note in return. And gift receipts. That's another important thing that seems like it goes without saying, but make sure you get them out. You acknowledge things quickly. And with your, when you receive a gift, make sure you acknowledge it and put it to good use. Let them know how their actual donation impacted the money that they gave. Now, according to Nonprofit Pro, 96 donors are lost for every 100 gained. Now that sounds very discouraging, but it doesn't have to be. That doesn't have to be the case. People talk a lot in the nonprofit sector about donor retention. That is hugely important, but I think you've got to take that one step further and think about donor loyalty. Loyal donors will stay around when you build strong relationships with them, they become your long-term supporters. And how do you do that? Well, one great way to do that is through a branded donor program, a program that recognizes their loyalty, their multi-year consecutive giving, as well as your cumulative giving. How might you set something like that up? Well, you can, those folks would perhaps get a special newsletter. They'd get invited to a members only event. They might get special tickets for something that your organization is doing. You provide them networking opportunities so they can come together with other like-minded people. And branded gifts are also an option. So think about different and creative ways to engage people. Now I told you earlier what 
one important takeaway was, and this is probably the second thing that I hope you'll leave with today. I'm sure you're all doing this, but I want to talk about it for just a minute. Tracking and measuring your success is hugely important. As your program grows, it's absolutely impossible to manage these relationships without the appropriate customer relationship management tool. So use that tool to capture this constituent data so that you know what is that donor spouse's name? What are their interests? Where did they go to college? Very important to track that. Also, you should include interest areas and constituent feedback. When a constituent tells you something, are you capturing that? Are you putting that in your notes? And another important thing to do is identify and resolve any constituent concerns. You know, bad news does not get better with time. So the quicker you can respond to any constituent concerns, the better off you will be. And finally, I want to just recap by saying, sharing five things with you to help you with your relationship building as you go forward. Be authentic. I think all of us can spot someone who's not authentic a mile away. So be real. Be frequent. It's important to continue to touch your constituents in many different ways throughout the year. And think about it for those closest to you at least seven times annually. Be personal. I think about the story of my friend and the Brain Injury Foundation and how personal that relationship became. And I can tell you, as you know, someone who loves the nonprofit arena, many of my dearest friends are people that I met through development work. Be present. When you're with your donors, you know, be with them where they are. When they have things that are important going on in their lives, be the person that is there. Be timely. This is often a difficult one, whether you're in a 150 person development shop in a major university or you're in a small nonprofit, being timely can be a real challenge. But it's absolutely essential. And think about ways that you can give special benefits to your constituents. Maybe that's an exclusive uh, briefing with your CEO or the president of your college. Maybe it's providing a subject matter expert on what your nonprofit is doing to various organizations that might be important to your constituents. And finally, leave you with this final thought. Remember the two types of people they're all in the world, according to George, Johnny Isaacson, friends and future friends. Let's keep them and let's go out and make some new ones. Thank you so much for your time today and giving me the opportunity to share with you about constituent relations. I'm delighted at this point to share that our next presentation is this morning is a conversation with Rodney Bullard. Rodney is the Vice President of Corporate Responsibility with Chick-fil-A and Executive Director of the Chick-fil-A Foundation. And Rodney will be interviewed by Lisa Howell and Jeff Jowdy. Thank you. Well, it's, it's our privilege uh, now to uh, have a conversation with a well-known leader in Atlanta, Georgia, and throughout the country, uh, our mm -hmm. friend Rodney, Rodney Bullard. Uh, Rodney, we welcome you to the Effective Nonprofit Leadership Summit. Jeff, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you for all that you do. Well, we're, we are honored, and for our 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 participants who may not be familiar with Rodney, and most are, but Rodney's Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility at Chick-fil-A and Executive Director of the Chick-fil-A Foundation, where he leads the company's corporate community and philanthropic strategy, which is focused on fostering youth and furthering education. And prior to joining Chick-fil-A, Rodney served as an Assistant United States Attorney prosecuting uh, complex criminal cases, uh, for his service, the United States Attorney General presented him with one of the Department of Justice's highest honors, the Director's Award. Prior to this role, Rodney was selected as a White House Fellow, uh, the nation's most prestigious public service fellowship. A decorated veteran, 
Rodney served in the United States uh, Air Force Judge Advocate General Corps, where he worked in the Pentagon in the office of the Secretary of Air Force. And Rodney is an alumnus of the United States Air Force Academy, Duke University uh, School of Law, and the University of Georgia's Terry College of Business and the Harvard Business School's Advanced Management Program. Rodney serves on several boards, uh, local and national. Uh, he serves on the board of directors of Ameris Bank, the Air Force Academy Athletic Corporation, the Westside Future Fund, Atlanta History Center, Junior Achievement of America. He's an alumnus of Leadership Georgia and Leadership Atlanta. And a few of Rodney's most recent recognitions include the Dale Threadgill Community Service Award in 2019, uh, being listed in Atlanta Magazine's 500 Most Influential Atlantans uh, for the past three years, and being recognized as one of Atlanta's most admire, admired CEOs uh, with the Atlanta Business Journal. And very importantly for our participants, uh, Rodney is author of Heroes Wanted, why the world needs you to live your heart out. And if there's ever been a more important time for that message and that mm -hmm. theme, it's now. So uh, when I look forward to getting this uh, autograph signed, uh, but please uh, check out uh, Heroes Wanted. Thank you, so. thank you. And Jeff, I was remiss earlier. I wanna say thank you to Lisa as well. And uh, cause she's been wonderful. And, and, and so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rodney. It's our honor and pleasure to have you here today. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, we look forward to engaging in some conversation and learning from you. And I know our participants do. Uh, Elisa, do you want to begin? Yes, thank you. So for our first question, um, Rodney, um, we're interested in knowing um, what are you seeing in the philanthropic world as nonprofits emerge um, from the pandemic? You know, we're seeing a number of trends uh, and so much happened over the last year, year and a half. Uh, one of the things that obviously happened was the uh, the unfortunate and uh, criminal death of George Floyd. Uh, but that sparked uh, uh, an awareness of equity, uh, particularly racial equity. And so you see nonprofits um, engaging in a manner that sometimes shakes up the manner in which they were giving sometimes observes who in fact is making the decisions on giving. Uh, for us at Chick-fil-A, we were very mindful that 70% of our gifts prior to uh, George Floyd or 2019 were going to communities of color. Uh, but we set up in one of our programs and one of our grant giving mechanisms, the True Inspiration Awards, uh, we dedicated those gifts to uh, communities of color and whole. And we also were mindful of finding leaders, nonprofit leaders, who were supporting communities of color who also are of color. Uh, because that is, in many cases, not as apparent uh, to nonprofit foundations and not as frequent as you would think. And so making sure that we're supporting everybody. And, and when I say everybody, it's not just people of color, that's everybody. Uh, we wanna support everybody who's doing good, uh, regardless of where they come from or what they look like. Um, but that has been one moment that we have definitely focused in on. Another moment that we focused in on is how do we bring nonprofits back? Because some nonprofits uh, really shriveled during the pandemic. Giving in many cases uh, went down and in many cases the need went up, but the ability to meet that need was not as strong. So we just hosted an accelerator, a nonprofit accelerator with over 250 nonprofits from across uh, the country uh, because we want to get them back on track. But even more so, we want to get them to a point where they can scale and grow from where they currently are or where they currently were. Uh, and then the last piece is obviously the pandemic is not over. And so helping people understand that the pandemic is not over. We are uh, hopefully at the end of the tunnel, uh, but we haven't gotten through the tunnel. And so we still need to encourage vaccinations. We still need to encourage testing. Uh, in many cases, and now that children uh, of a certain age can in fact get the vaccine, we need to encourage that as well. So those are the things that I see. Uh, the last piece that I, I will say, because I know that's a mouthful, but 
how do we come out of this and help children with learning loss? Because so many children lost a full year of academics uh, and so many children have behavioral and mental health issues as a consequence of that as well. And so those are the things that I'm seeing trending. Yeah, thank you. That's very insightful and um, I completely agree with um, all of your comments. So thank you for that. I think Jeff is um, going to ask you about um, the next topic we wanted to discuss. Yeah. And thank, thanks, Lisa. And really a follow up, Rodney. And of course, you mentioned several things like uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and and being sure that nonprofits are are reaching people of color. So some of the pandemic related awareness, uh, I guess, will be permanent, we hope. And but what do you see in terms of things that have uh, happened uh, during the pandemic that either you feel will be uh, changes ongoing or should be? No, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I think will be a change is just the manner in which we meet. I mean, the, the, the mere fact that we are here virtually, I think that there is an opportunity to leverage technology for nonprofit organizations in ways that we have not seen, whether it be the delivery of services, whether it be uh, socialization of nonprofits to funders and allowing them to see and touch and understand and experience the delivery that a nonprofit may have. Uh, and to get the word out. Uh, uh, that has been uh, something that I think we will continue to leverage and figure out new ways to leverage. And, and I hope that, that we do that. Now, obviously, I hope that we can get back in person uh, when it is um, and safe and prudent to do so. But this technology, I think, is here to stay. Great. Thank you. And uh, Rodney, um, your foundation's goal is to nourish the potential in every child by partnering with um, organizations working to address education, homelessness, and hunger in the communities Chick-fil-A um, serves. Uh, what gaps do you see in society that nonprofits should be um, filling? You know, the major gap that we really are beginning to embark on and beginning to put some uh, emphasis on is this effort of workforce development. Uh, and, and I think about all of those things that you just mentioned, hunger, education, housing, uh, particularly here in Atlanta. Uh, Jeff mentioned that I'm on the board of the West Side Future Fund. It is an amazing organization with an amazing board uh, led by Dr. Beverly Tatum, former president of Spelman College, and John Amon, who is the executive director. Uh, and our effort has been to really further affordable housing and to stave off gentrification by helping the legacy residents of the West Side to remain in their homes. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that's a difficult proposition in the face of market trends, that market forces typically from a real estate standpoint will overwhelm affordable housing. We've seen it in places like Decatur, where I grew up. Uh, we've seen it in places like Eastlake. We've seen it throughout the country, Georgetown, uh, Kiowa in uh, South Carolina, those used to be very different places than what they are now. Um, but at the end of the day, affordability is relative. And so if you can work on workforce development, if you can help children get into jobs and have skills that actually allow them to be in the workforce meaningfully in abundance, then they can afford greater housing. And so to me, we are band-aiding a whole host of things, and the opportunity for us is really around workforce. I, I'll dismount with this. You know, there are about 500,000 jobs that go unfilled. And if I go to Southern Company, they're going to say, well, look, we need linesmen. Uh, and if I go to Cleveland Electric, they're going to say, we need electricians. Uh, those are good-paying jobs. We need traveling nurses that make well into the six figures. Uh, but we have skills that are going unmatched. Um, and consequently, I think there's opportunity for us to actually do more. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And Ronnie, what would you see as the corporate's, uh, corporate world's role or responsibility in, in addressing the gaps that you just described? I think the corporate community has as much, if not more, stake in the game than anyone else. Uh, oftentimes, people will look to government for that. And government is very much a, uh, 
a player uh, in it, but the corporate community, one is the employer for many of those instances. Um, and the corporate community also is the one who's gonna provide the skills along with you know, a technical college system of Georgia, or along with um, private schools or, um, or a board of regents. But uh, the technical college system of Georgia is responding to the needs of the private community. And so the corporate community has a great deal of stake in that and has to continue to push that. And, and, and there are definitely programs out there. I just think that there can be even more programs. And I think that it can be even greater coordination. Thank you. Thank you. And Rodney, you serve on a corporate bank board as well as lead a nonprofit foundation um, with the board, as well as having corporate responsibility for Chick-fil-A. What do you see as the key differences in the role of a, a for-profit and a nonprofit board? You know, I, I think that the fiduciary duty uh, is very similar. I think the duty is a duty of care, a duty of uh, efficacy, um, and to ensure that whatever the mission is, you're getting it done. At the end of the day, I think we create false distinctions between nonprofit leaders and for-profit leaders. And I think it sometimes it creates this uh, condescension. Uh, and we say, well, that's just nonprofit work or philanthropic work. That's pithy. Uh, the truth of the matter is nonprofit work, the focus is to solve problems, hard problems, intractable problems, problems that frankly uh, have not been solved easily over the years. And so the work of a nonprofit leader is particularly tough. Uh, you've got to raise money. You've got to be able to execute just as well as a for-profit leader. Um, and oftentimes there is competition in the nonprofit world that I don't see in the for-profit world uh, because there's this feeling of a scarcity of resource. Uh, and if I get the resources and someone else won't, and if they get it, then I won't. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case. So I would love to see more collaboration uh in the nonprofit world as i often see in the for-profit world again going back to west side future fund those uh the west side future fund is a collaboration of for-profit companies home depot equifax delta sun uh, truest now uh chick-fil-a coca-cola etc coming together because we know that we have the resources we have the the health and the gravitas and we have the longevity to get something done Thank you for that. Rodney, I can't imagine the number of nonprofits in a given year, even that you're invited to to serve on the board. Uh, you, you obviously serve with distinction on, on, on several. When you're presented with the opportunity to serve on a nonprofit board, what criteria do you use in evaluating the opportunity and making a decision? No, that's a great question. And I am blessed with the opportunity to serve on some wonderful boards and I've had to turn down some uh, equally wonderful boards as well. Um, I think serving on a board is a is an honor and a privilege. And, uh, you know, when I first got into this role, uh, I don't know if I fully understood it, but now I see really the uh, the distinction and the opportunity that you have to feed another organization, to lend your shoulder and your mind, et cetera, to another organization. So the criteria has to be, is this something that first and foremost you're interested in and passionate about? Because if it's not, then there's no reason for you to be on that board. Uh, you're a drag, you're taking a seat, and uh, the mere fact that you can write a check or the mere fact that you can uh, lend your name or whatever is not enough, frankly. Uh, someone else can fill that seat. So first, your passion. And then second, do you have the time? Uh, and then I think third, um, what specifically can you give? And I tell folks uh, that uh, that I serve with, or I tell boards that I serve on, I may not be able to make every meeting, but I will meet with you personally. I will give you this specific thing. And we're going to figure out early on how am I going to help? It may be in marketing. It may be uh, in fundraising and development. Um, it may be in something else that we specifically are looking at strategy. Uh, so give something very specific uh, that you know you can give to that board. Um, and I think that's very helpful. 
Thank you. And Rodney, where do you um, see the newly energized focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, where do you see that role and how it plays um, into um, the effect of internally uh, in the communities? Um, where do you see the nonprofits fulfilling that need? So I, I think nonprofits fulfill the need of, uh, of equity um, in the manner in which we go about our business and also in the manner in which we use our voices and our influence. So first, uh, I'll talk about how we go about our business. You know, we have to be mindful that, in fact, we are uh, supporting nonprofit leaders of color, nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. and we have to be mindful that we have diversity on our own boards and in our own decision making. Um, because that will lead to different outcomes. We have to be mindful that we are hiring people uh, in an equitable and diverse manner. Uh, all those lead to different outcomes. Uh, we have to, uh, because there are different ways in which you can do this. You can open your giving by invitation. And if you do that, then who are you inviting in? Uh, you can broadly do it as in, because we have an invitation model at Chick-fil-A, but we also have a competitive model at Chick-fil-A, the Transformation Awards. And so how are you doing it in a competitive model? Is it equitable? Can everybody truly have a, a strong playing field uh, in what you're asking for as far as an application, the length of the application, the depth of the application? Um, you know, one of the things that we do within the True Inspiration Awards is we put um, we put it out on our app and we allow our, our customers also to vote. And that's wonderful. Um, but if I'm, you know, a unified school district, then I'm going to have an advantage. And so that's not all of the voting that is part of the voting. And so we weight that accordingly. Um, and then I think the other piece is is just using your our voice. And that's really identifying what are issues of equity and then calling those out. Um, you know, we are unabashed when we talk about the West Side Future Fund, when we talk about the West Side of Atlanta, that we really do understand that this is a community that is 99 percent black. It's a community where Dr. King came back to uh, once he was in Montgomery and he led the civil rights movement from there. His ancestral home is still there. And, you know, this is a community where the Atlanta University Center is located in. And so the culture of the community should retain. And we have an obligation as the businesses of Atlanta to help that culture retain and help those legacy residents if they want to stay in. And when I think of that phrase, I think of my grandmother, I think of my great aunt, and I think of rising cost and can they on a fixed income stay in their homes? And I think if we have that image, which is a true image, then we all should want that and we all should speak up for that. And that at the same time, we definitely want diversity uh, in the in our neighborhoods. I think that breeds a great deal. And that's one of our issues. We have a crisis of connection. And so uh, before we leave, I do want to talk about the beloved benefit. But uh, this, this crisis of connection is great, but it doesn't mean we have to displace people uh, to have diversity in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Ronnie, are there a few questions, key questions that a nonprofit should be asking itself uh, in terms of it, per, its performance uh, regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion? You know, I, I think the question is, first and foremost, who are you serving? So who's your constituency? Who's your, your, your client? Who's your consumer? Uh, that's the question that we all should ask first and foremost. And regardless of what that person or persons or community looks like, you know, who is that person? Know them intimately. Uh, and how can we broaden that if, in fact, it is a narrow set? And then if it is a narrow set and we are delivering services to them and we don't have a broad and equi a broad set of people who are also physically the ones delivering the services, how can we improve that? Um, you know, I have a very diverse shop at, at Chick-fil-A and the Chick-fil-A and CSR and Chick-fil-A Foundation. Uh, and we're blessed to have a very diverse cohort of people working there. Uh, and that helps us connect to communities broadly. And Ronnie, maybe as a follow up, you had mentioned the Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Would you like yes. to share your thoughts? And Absolutely. So uh, 
Dr. King really envisioned a community, uh, and it's a Quaker notion that he, he popularized uh, as well, particularly in black churches, but this community of the beloved community where people come together and everybody, regardless of difference, had a place at the table and that there were no isms, <clears throat> no sexism, no racism. Uh, we did not divide ourselves based off of our differences, but we came together based off of our commonalities. And so one of the things that we're very proud of and hope that we get a chance to press the play button again on is the beloved benefit. And the beloved benefit happened in 2019. Uh, we uh, brought together about 2000 of our closest friends in Atlanta on the floor of the Mercedes Benz Stadium. And we made sure that the money that was being raised on the evening because it was a benefit dinner uh, was going towards the west side of Atlanta. And so every dollar that was raised went towards the west side. In fact, uh, Chick-fil-A and Arthur Blank underwrote the cost uh, so that every dollar that was given and was raised was given to a nonprofit community or nonprofit effort on the west side. And we made sure that 20% of the tickets or more, I think it was upwards of 25% of the tickets, went to residents of the west side. And we also made sure we didn't have round tables. We had family style tables and it wasn't black tie, it was come as you are. And so we want to integrate Atlanta. We want to make sure that folks ate together, sat together, spoke, conversed in fellowship. And then we had Bruno Mars as our entertainment and it was a big party. And we had a wonderful time and we plan on doing that again. Uh, we hope to do it either at the latter part of 2021 or spring uh, early part of 2022 depending on when we can open up again uh, in full fashion but that's important uh, it was important not just from an optical standpoint but it was important from an awareness standpoint because many people who don't live on the west side or, or aren't engaged in these issues don't know uh, you know the west side is it starts right across the street from the mercedes-benz stadium and people go to the falcons game uh, and if they're like me, they're long suffering Falcons fans and we go and we cry uh, and then we go home. <laughs> and so uh, uh, but you don't know what's necessarily going on across the street or you have some false sense of what's going on across the street. You think poorly about a community that's very proud and historic. Mm -hmm. And so we want to change that narrative. Yeah, well, that sounds like a wonderful event and it's very wonderful that you're involved in that. Um, We'd, yeah, we'd love to hear more about that as well and become involved. Um, Rodney, and then your book is titled Heroes Wanted, Why the World Needs You to Live Your Heart Out. Um, so in your perspective, what does it mean to live your heart out? What makes a hero in terms of making a difference in the world? Yes. You know, I wrote Heroes Wanted in part because we all suffer from this sense of heroism. Uh, we're waiting on somebody to come save us. We we have watched Superman and, and Wonder Woman, and we are expecting one or two or all of them to come save us at some point. Uh, we look to uh, to CNN for a billionaire or whatever, and that person isn't coming, frankly. Uh, and if they do come, they can't lift all of the ills that we have in our community and solve all the problems. And so at the end of the day, it's up to us as individuals to do what we can in our own space, and our own strength. And I think it's very important that we see our own selves as heroes. Uh, when I was in first grade, I had a difficult time reading and I had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Adams. And Mrs. Adams um, spent additional time with me during the summer to help me read. And frankly, I thought that I was giving up my summer. But now as an adult, I realized she was giving up her summer. And I'm grateful to Mrs. Adams because at the end of those three months uh, of the summer, I was reading two and three grade levels ahead of my peers. And if it had not been for Mrs. Adams doing what she could do in her time and her strength in her space, then I wouldn't be here, frankly. I would be living a different life. And so I welcome everybody to do what they can uh, and be a hero in their own space. Thank you. That's that's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Rodney, it's our pleasure and honor to have you here today. Um, it was time well worth um, our time. And thank you so much for providing 
um, your time. We know your time is precious, but it's very valuable to us in the nonprofit community and learning and um, having more insight in terms of how nonprofits can help um, your insight. I know it's my pleasure and Jeff's pleasure, um, Malden and Jenkins and Lighthouse Council, pleasure to have you here today and just can't thank you enough um, for your time. Well, Elisa and Jeff, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for doing this podcast and, and, and allowing me to come on. Uh, and we continue to uh, to look for partners like you in this work and in this fight. So God bless. Thank you. Thanks, Rodney. Um, very inspiring message. And um, I want to thank Karen. And I was telling Karen, it's one of the um, best sessions I've heard um, Karen give and um, is inspiring. And Jeff and Elisa. And um, I want to thank everybody who contributed, you know, to this, this session. And um, we and our partners at Lighthouse Council thank our special guest, um, Rodney and Bonnie. And it, it's great to hear from both of them. And we wanna thank all of you as participants for joining us today. And we hope you enjoyed the program and gained insights to use in the important work that you do every day. And we'd love to hear from you. Anything at all that you need, reach out to Lighthouse or Malden and Jenkins and we'll be happy to work with you and help you. And we look forward to seeing you at our next effective nonprofit leadership summit and our best wishes to you and hoping that you have a happy and safe summer. Thanks everyone.